Hello everybody and welcome to this Wednesday evening study. I was not satisfied with the work that I did with you last week and I thought I should come back to <clears throat> the, uh, the second letter in Smyrna and take another run at that one and then maybe uh, we'll also be able to do Pergamum this evening. Um, I just felt like we just skipped over a lot of things and uh, it was my own fault for doing it. So now this evening I'm uh, competing with uh, an air conditioner. It, it just got way too hot in the little room where I'm working. So um, I hope that you can hear me and I'll try to speak up as we go so that the uh, the sound uh, is is really pretty good and uh, uh, I hope that uh, at the end of the evening you'll feel uh, like we've had some meaningful time together in the Word. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, unless you teach us we are hopelessly lost and we ask you Lord to come and and take these words in these letters and make them live for us in our hearts and minds. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's take a look now uh, at the map that we used uh, just to locate these uh, churches and we see John's island of Patmos where he was exiled and the first city to the east of Patmos is Ephesus that's probably the harbor that is spoken of in Ephesus and then Smyrna and the church at Pergamum. All three of these first letters are near harbors and so uh, their uh, economic and uh, transportation and, and trading capabilities were all linked to those harbors as well as to the trade routes that were further inland in Asia Minor. And this is all the modern uh, modern terrain of Turkey now. And so you can see the area as it was divided into uh, parcels. There's Lydia in the central part and then uh, Mesia the uh, northern part and uh, Phrygia, the, another region, and uh, we have Lycia, and there is Pamphylia, and, and there is Petra on the coast right there. So, uh, and then here is Pisidia, all these regions have uh, uh, different uh, rulers but all under the thumb of Rome at the time when we are discussing these things so let's let's move our attention to the city of Smyrna and uh, we're reading from Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11 from the New International Version to the angel of the church in Smyrna write these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again I know your afflictions and your poverty yet you are rich I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. 
I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by uh, hurt at all by the second death. The letter addressed to the church in Smyrna, modern day Izmir, is the only one of the seven that are still in existence. All the other cities have faded, but Smyrna is, uh, or Izmir, is still active. You can see on the map the distance between Smyrna and Ephesus is about 35 miles, and it's, uh, we spoke about the importance of its harbor in exports. Smyrna was second only to Ephesus, and Smyrna was a proud and beautiful city. Three to four hundred years after it had been destroyed by the Aletes king of Lydia. Oh goodness, that's more history than I really wanted to look at with you. Let's go down. During the period when Rome was uh, engaged in a struggle for supremacy against the Carthagian, uh, Carthaginian Empire, this brings us roughly 265 to 146 BC, Smyrna had placed itself squarely on the side of Rome and in 195 it became the first, this is 195 BC, it became the first city in the ancient world to build a temple in honor of Dei or Dea Roma, the uh, honor of Rome. Later in 23 BC Smyrna won permission to build a temple to the Emperor Tiberius, and this brings Smyrna into the story of uh, Jesus. This strong allegiance to Rome put a large Jewish population that was actively hostile to the Christians, and uh, they made it exceptionally difficult to live as a Christian in Smyrna. The most famous martyrdom of the early church fathers was that of the elderly Polycarp, the twelfth martyr in Smyrna, who upon his refusal to acknowledge Caesar as Lord was placed on a pyre to be burned. We do not know when the church was first founded in Smyrna, but it is reasonable to suppose it could have been during the period when Paul lived in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, um, the church was already well organized with a bishop, polycarp, elders, and deacons. We have uh, the destination clearly written all in verse 8 of chapter 2 to the angel of the church in Smyrna. And the command to write is simply write. The prophetic formula, these are the words of, and then the title for Christ, him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. So we see when this first happened, when the, when the words were first used, the first and the last, we're reading in, in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 and 18 John describes when I first saw him I fell at his feet as though dead 
Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So from verses 17 and 18, we see into some of the meaning of what Jesus says to the church in Smyrna. Him who is, these are the words of Christ, who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. The church at Smyrna was a persecuted church. So the letter comes from the Sovereign One. He, he mentions he is the first and the last, and that is the one who was, the one who existed before anything else was created, and the last, the one who will come on the last day and judge people rightly. And then as he was victorious over death, so the ones who face their own death and remain faithful to him are rewarded with eternal life. They are the ones who will be victorious as he was. When he says, do not be afraid, this Jesus had spoken many times in his lifetime. When he approached the disciples walking on the water in Matthew 14, verse 27, he spoke, do not be afraid, right away. And when they had fallen on their faces, having heard the voice of God from heaven, in Matthew 17, verse 7, he said, Do not be afraid. There is no cause for fear because the one who was speaking was the first and the last. This title is essentially the same as the divine self-designation in Revelation 1, verse 8, the Alpha and the Omega. And in Revelation 22, verse 13, we have a third phrase, the beginning and the end. All of them declare, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. That comes from Isaiah 44, verse 6. So the the history and the usage of those phrases, those three, any of those three point to the Sovereign Lord, the one who is from the beginning and, and in through the end, and the title emphasizes the absolute sovereignty of God. He is absolutely in charge over all. Don't be afraid. Even death is no big thing because he is the living one who has conquered death and holds it in his power. <clears throat> and for Christ, even though he experienced death in the course of his earthly ministry. He is alive forever. He has in his possession the keys of death and Hades, and this grants him power and authority over their domain, over all the earth. According to Jewish literature, power over these keys belongs to God alone, and because they are now in the possession of Christ, this is evidence that Christ is the same as God the Father. 
and that he has been elevated to that place of power and I guess we're talking about a place where he himself is is the prominent it's 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 really between the father and the son they're so equal and they are so co-eternal that to distinguish one as being above the other Christ himself gives respect to God the Father and now that he has been elevated and ascended back to the throne of God he as the Lamb of God receives a lot of special uh, a lot of special duties and uh, a special prominence throughout the book he has this encouragement for the church in Smyrna I know your afflictions and your poverty yet you are rich I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not but are a synagogue of Satan the church at Smyrna has been through a lot and has been materially poor and this has not gone unnoticed by the Lord of the church the Lord of the church everywhere God is fully aware of the pressures brought against the faithful the linking of affliction and poverty means that they were very much they were brought poverty was brought along with affliction and hard times it would be difficult for the Christian to make a living and so many were economically destitute they may also have been victims of mob violence and looting in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 34 and 35 it says you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions so do not throw away your confidence it will be richly rewarded their poverty was a material poverty spiritually they were rich and this will be noted later on James wrote to a similar group indicating that God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and Christ is also aware he knows of the accusations that come against believers from the Jewish population in Smyrna and with all of the death and the persecution and even the betrayal from those who should know who may have in the past been more friendly the hostility to Christians especially seems to come from their conviction the Jews were so convicted and so believed that because the Christians worshipped a Galilean peasant who had died a criminal's death they worshipped someone who was below and could not possibly have been God because of what happened to him and this this struggle because Jesus didn't look like the Savior his saving us came in the, a most unexpected way and it's because of this that Jews typically do not believe 
and let's pray that all of those who we speak to would be aware of the great sacrifice that Christ, really, that God made in Christ. And Christ reassures them in verse 10, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. And brothers and sisters, for us to be faithful to the point of death is to wait on Christ and not give up any of our beliefs and not compromise just to stay alive a little while longer. Be faithful to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Overcomers are promised that they will not in any way be hurt by the second death. In Revelation 20 verse 14, it is identified as the lake of fire. And in 21 verse 8, as the final lot of the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile. In Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15 say, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And this type of person is mentioned in verse uh, 8 of chapter 21. The cowardly the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. But if you remain faithful, if you resist all temptation, the second death has no power over those who share in the first resurrection. We will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the church at Smyrna who those Christians are being persecuted and being uh, given over to the authorities because of their particular beliefs. When we go to Pergamum and speak of Pergamum, we see that Christ is portrayed as one who has a sharp, double-edged sword. It was the sword of his mouth. And he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. And you see that Pergamum was that third location on the mail route from Ephesus to Smyrna, and then Pergamum, another coastal city uh, with a harbor. And those are the Christians to whom we refer. I know where you live, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. 
Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. The ancient city of Pergamum is now the modern village of Bergama in Mycia or Mysia, Turkey, located about 16 miles from the Aegean Sea alongside the Caius River Valley. Pergamum is located on a sharp, rugged hill rising a thousand feet above the surrounding plain, and it is a steep hill up to the Acropolis. But on top of that hill, I guess they're calling it, the Acropolis is visible from a long way away and accessible only from the southern slope. These geographical features create an ideal site for a fortress. And with its public buildings built on terraces, on the steep hillside, with multiple temples as part of its Acropolis, Pergamum was one of the most beautiful cities during the Hellenistic period. Let's move on. the gods that they worshipped included Zeus, Athena, Heracles, Telephus, and there were all kinds of stories that you might or might not remember from Greek mythology, but the Greek mythology survived and some of it was Romanized as the Roman Empire took root and ruled over them all. Zeus was the god of the sky and the thunder. He was king of all other gods and men, the chief figure in Greek mythology, the son of Kronos, and Ray, probably most famous for his infidelity to his sister and wife, Hera. Athena, in Greek religion, was the protector of the city, goddess of war, handicraft, and practical reason. She was of the city and was civilized. She was the opposite of Artemis, the goddess of the outdoors. Heracles, also known as Alcides and Hercules. Hercules was his Roman name. The son of Zeus and Alcmena, a hero noted for his great strength, courage, and for the performance of 12 immense labors. And wow, do they get complicated. Since Roman times, Heracles was the greatest of all Greek heroes, half god and half human, and you can imagine all the tales that were told surrounding him. And then Telephus, in Greek mythology, the son of Heracles and Oga, there's a great, long story involved there. And when we get to our more pertinent history, after all of the Greek 
gods and the kings and successors of the kings. Let's get into the Roman era. With Roman control increasing, there were uh, fewer options and King Attalus III left his kingdom to Roman administration upon his death in 133 BC. The Romans then made it the capital of their province of Asia, so Pergamum became the capital. Under Roman rule, Pergamum remained the most important city in the area. During the first century, its population is estimated to have been over 150,000 residents. And so we have uh, lots of religious in the way of all of those gods that they worshipped, including the worship of emperors. The city had numerous temples dedicated to Greek deities, Athena, Zeus, Dionysus, Asclepius, Hera, Demeter, and Persephone, as well as Egyptian deities, uh, Serapis, Isis, and Harpocrates. It is a, a mess of people, uh, of gods in that area. So, some great and uh, uh, spacious temples, some built on that Acropolis. There was uh, the shrine and the uh, Asclepion, the shrine of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And this is interesting because during the, the Roman period, this was built in the lower city. Most of the buildings are visible there today belong to that complex that uh, was built in the second century. The cult of Asclepius at Pergamum dates back to about 350 BC when it was introduced from uh, the Greeks. And because things were so blurry, you have this hospital, basically, that was combined with a sanctuary and a spa. So you have the medicine, but it's, it's combined and associated so thoroughly with the worship of these Greek gods that they were easily accepted by the locals, but for the Christians who had come to believe that Jesus alone was Lord and was sovereign, and Jesus, all healing came from Jesus. It was very difficult to return to these kinds of things. We're running out of time, so let me begin uh, by talking about Jews and Christians in Pergamum. The next time we get together, I'll begin right there. Thank you very much for being with me this evening and for letting me dig back into some of these areas that we just glossed over the last time. We'll begin again here in Pergamum and make our way around the postal route that you see from Pergamum to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and then back to Ephesus. Thank you, my friends, for joining in this evening. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Thank you. Good night.